And then he stood up and he said, you're home, mate. You're home, mate. Well, we've made a big decision while you were away. And I said, what was that? And he said, we're going to inter an unknown Australian soldier in the Hall of Memory. I mean, how could you say no to that? So I came back and said yes to Michael. Um, and that's where it all started. It was a surrogate for the battlefields that they could never visit. And we believe that they deserve the opportunity of completing that remembrance and that reflective grief with the opportunity of in viewing a real grave of a real soldier who died in the service of his country. I thought it was great. I thought that to have the opportunity to, to be involved in this, jog the younger generation's uh, minds about the, the horrors of war. It's not about celebrating, it's, it's about commemorating those who, who laid their lives uh, on the line. We're not glorifying war, we're, just, we're remembering someone that represents everybody. That was the objective, to make people conscious of what war does to a nation. I said, if, if this happens, it's not Gallipoli. Gallipoli is not in this. This is the Western Front. It has to be the Western Front. That's where we lost the most. Because each cemetery has a register when you go over to France. You tick a little box, you pick it out, and you look at who's buried here. And each one of them also has a, a description of the, the statistics of the cemetery. So it'll, it'll, it'll tell you, you know, there are 600 identified graves and there are 400 unidentified graves. So you can very quickly go across every single burial ground in the Western Front from the smallest to the biggest and you can determine how many Australian unknown soldiers there are buried in each of these cemeteries. So we then wrote back to the Commission and said, right, what would you propose? And back came the reply very quickly, leave it to us. And what the Commonwealth War Graves had picked four graves right, for the possibility of this exhumation. The, the unknown soldier was to come from the, this big Australian plot in Adelaide Cemetery, which is right at the edge of the, the final advance of the Germans. You, know, you couldn't have found a more symbolic spot to actually do this. So they had thought about this. And they had obviously thought about all the soil issues and you know the issues of finding what you want, which is the, the proper remains of an unknown soldier. And, uh, the very first grave that they dug uh, was the, I mean, and I won't say any more than that, the remains of an unknown Australian soldier. You know, and quite clearly Australian uh, because of bits and pieces like equipment and so on that, 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 that were there. So there was, no, there was no doubt that that's who it was. So he is, he's as anonymous as you can possibly make him. He, he was carried by a military ambulance and a, a, a small escort. And people in the streets, surprisingly, they didn't know what it was. They were taking their hats off. You know, it was this sort of something you would have seen in Australia years ago. We're at the other end of the airstrip, ready to go to march on the bearer party with a coffin. And we couldn't see anything because of the fog. And then we've marched up through the fog. You can hear the music, hear the band, it's to put the body onto the plane. Is the, the pilot come on and explain to the captain what was on there, you know, that there was a body of an unknown Australian soldier on this plane being taken home. Of course, and the people on the plane were just stunned, you know, with, with that. Beanard at some point had said, if you ever did bring an unknown soldier back to Canberra, the Hall of Memory is the place to put him. All the other entries had the turn on a plinth or, an, you know, in a raised thing of some sort. In the ground was perfect. It's where he had been for all those years. It meant that any person visiting the tomb would put his head down in thoughtful, prayerful, if you like, reflective gratitude for what that soldier represents to all Australians. It did raise some quite serious issues in terms of how we went about the construction work because you can't, for instance, cut a hole in the concrete floor and let dust get onto those 70 umpty thousand tiles because you can't dust them. You can't have major vibrations going in or you'll have the tiles falling down. So when the, when the remains arrived here, it was taken straight to uh, Old Parliament House and, uh, and placed in King's Hall. We mounted a catafalque party. When we opened the doors at Old Parliament House on the 8th of November, and s the thousands of people that streamed through, 
shocked us. We, we just didn't realise how many people were engaged in this. And one of the things they did that we did not anticipate was uh, they did this lay a single flower thing. They, they brought flowers. And so eventually the whole area around that coffin was completely piled with flowers, you know, from obviously mainly Canberra people. But they came in their thousands to, to, to walk past that coffin. You'll remember that the Anzac Parade was lined with uh, thousands of uh, former servicemen and women of Australia with the banners that they would have carried uh, on their Anzac Day marches. And as the funeral procession passed, they fell in behind. So eventually we had this massive sea of people walking up Anzac Parade with the banners from all parts of the world in which Australians had fought. The gun carriage set off from the bottom of Anzac Parade. The band was playing Dead March in Saul. I was walking alone. And I was looking at the faces of the people lining the route. And I saw on those Australian faces emotions I had never before seen in my life. They were deeply engaged incredibly moved, men and women in tears. I cleared the speech with Prime Minister Keating. Michael, you know I'm not a good reader of speeches, but he said, this is so important and it is so beautifully written that I will practice this and practice this and practice this. He is all of them and he's one of us. And that's his speech on the wall. And that's his speech on the wall. Bob Coombe, a veteran of the First World War, whom we'd met, who'd been one of the people travelling with us on, um, on the trip in, to France and Belgium, uh, and had been awarded the military medal in France. Um, and we'd asked him if he would sprinkle soil that we'd collected from the windmill site uh, near Mouquet Farm, above Mouquet Farm which Charles Bean had written was soil most thickly drenched in Australian blood of any soil anywhere in the world. Sat down beside him and said to him on the day, this is, this is what we're going to do when we get the prompt, you know, you'll come up here, I'll be with you. And he takes the soil and he goes to the coffin and he makes the sign of the cross as he drops the soil, which he had seen probably a dozen chaplains do at burials in France. And then Ray, Ray got him back to standing next to the Governor General. And Bill Hayden heard Bob Coombe say, You're home, mate. And just as he finished saying, You're home, mate, the first notes of the last post went out. We didn't know he was going to do that. It wasn't scripted, and in fact, if we had scripted it, it would have been wrong. It had to come from, we didn't have any right to say, mate. It had to come from the heart of another Anzac. The timing was perfect. Mm, we, yeah, with we timing. We lowered the casket, and as they pulled the straps out, it was exactly 11 o'clock, and the bugle played last post. Yeah. And you couldn't ask for it, it just it, seemed it, to be it's yeah. divine that it, it happened yeah. that way. I think everything that happens at the War Memorial now is changing because you can come here one year to the next and there's something different. But the, that remains the same. It, it's, it's come recently back to me that really Anzac is not about heroism or adventure. Most of what happened to the Anzacs was trying to stay alive Keep your mates alive, and an awful lot of them couldn't. And that's why there are the 60 plus thousand names. The, the guy in the tomb represents all of those people. And I'm very glad that we did it. Um, and it's probably over the 36 years of my military career, the highlight forget everything else. It's something that will stick in my head, I, I think, till the day I die. Uh, and it was on that day that uh, one young woman had put a 
paper poppy beside her name. That was the first time it had happened. And in the next, immediately following, people started doing all of this until by the time that that period when the tomb was open for people to walk past and visit it, the wall became a sea of paper poppies. And it's been ever thus.